Hello, welcome to Talking Cop. It's me, Chris Brack. We're back for another women's show, and I'm joined by my two friends, Neil Axon from the Anfield Wrap and Emma from the BBC. How are we? All good. Good, thank you. Good, good. That's fair. That's two spoke to each other. Gosh, that's how we did the show. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> no. But since then, I'm pretty certain, Neil, last time we did a show, we were saying, well, if we do okay in November, you know, a couple of wins, we should be all right. And um, let's be honest, November, December's gone much, much better than probably we'd hoped you know as in like we had ideas of where we get points but i think as a whole you know we can't really argue with the first half of the season this is you know the peak of where we thought this this current squad could get to um couldn't agree more really it's an excellent win just at the very end of november against brighton uh it's arguably a bit a bit frustrating uh home against bristol and mm. it's interesting really where the league table currently sits because there's probably a couple of games now where in hindsight and you know, you can all sound very, if you're not careful, you can always, always sound very what could have been. But, you know, Liverpool are in this very funny situation where right now they sit fifth and yet they, they probably should be beating Bristol at home. I think the Everton Anfield factor is is worthy of note. I think that the West Ham away game now feels like a little bit of drop points. But I think that, that we've got to not get too hung up on that because the idea that you've got what might have been, I think actually is, you know, it's a testament to how well they've done. Uh, in a lot of the other fixtures, so I, you know, I think there's there's loads and loads to be cheerful about. And as I say, that emphatic home win against Brighton, you know, I think I think that's the sort of one that you hang your hat on, uh, and hope that they can continue to show a fair bit of quality away from home when the opportunity is there for them. Yeah, I mean, Emma, uh, Neil points out that the away form has been the big upturn this year. You know, it says a lot where you're coming away from top away going draws a bit. Bit pants that we, we probably should have we probably did enough to probably win that in the end but this is Tottenham away and Tottenham you know are a difficult side to face and you know, they're only just below Liverpool in the league on goal difference but it's also what difference a year makes you know first game in January we get walloped by Man United quite comfortably this year it's 2 1 win over Man United and we're fully worth the 2 1 win yeah yeah 100% that Man United game for me was one of the best performances um, of the season so far by by any team really um, but also, I think, you know, when we're looking at the teams that we've drawn against, and you're right, um, certainly the Bristol City and the West Ham ones, I think, are slightly disappointing now in hindsight. Um, but actually, you look at the teams that we've lost against, and, you know, it's it's Man City, it's Chelsea, it's Arsenal, teams that Liverpool are expected to lose against. So I think that's, what is it, four four games they've lost. So, yeah, played 12, won five, drawn three, lost four. And out of those four, three of them are seriously big hitters. So I don't think there's any any disgrace in any of those defeats, um, really. And yeah, the draws will be disappointing. But actually, outside of the top uh, three, I mean, we used to say top four, but Man United this season haven't been anywhere near good enough. So the top three, um, every team in this WSL table, they drop points in games where you know they maybe are expected to pick up points. That's just part and parcel of the league. Just like what it is in the Premier League, you know, you have the likes of Liverpool and Man City that will obviously be sort of above the rest but in in the WSL it's it's the top three and then the rest so I don't think there's any disgrace in that at all and yeah the Tottenham as you mentioned Tottenham there that's probably one where that could have gone either way you know Tottenham uh, yeah. have, they've had a great season so no disgrace in drawing that one so yeah it really is for me only the Bristol City and the West Ham results and if you'd said to me last season that the most disappointing results would be two draws um, one away from home, then, you know, I I absolutely would have taken that. Yeah, I mean, the West Ham one, that's the worst 30 seconds of my life. And I spent 12 minutes out of time is that 30 seconds to go. It's awful. Um, but to pull the curtain back, this is the day after the the Arsenal results. And while well, I was so disgrace losing to Man City and Arsenal, because, you know, they're both, you know, in and around the title races, it also probably gives us a, not a reality check, but a little bit of a, this is where we are, this is what, that's, that's what we aspire to be is the Chelsea's, the Arsenal's, the money. Like we want to get to that level. So it, it allows Souls to see, you know, where we need to probably move on to be like the next stage. So this this season has been the big jump from last year was stay up. This year is looks at the moment comfortably best than the rest at the moment, which is more than ideal. So the question now is how do you close that gap? And that gap's hard to close. And we've seen Man United. You know, they're in and around European spots last this year, it's a bit of a struggle. So we know that next leap is probably the biggest. But I don't know where you sort of feel, Neil. Sorry, I didn't actually say a name then. I should have actually said a name. 
Well, yeah, of course, the next leap is sort of the biggest, but I think what you're able to see is that the steps are being taken and the steps forward have been made. So, you know, I think that's so far. I think the main thing, the most important thing is for Liverpool to feel as though every single time they, they step into the market to have a round of improvements. And I think it's interesting that there has been a ton uh, this time out because I, there's ultimately what I think they've done mostly, well, the, what they've mostly done and they've done well, not that they've, what they've mostly done a good job at because that's, you know, where, where for instance, Mia Enderby ends up is a separate conversation to this. But what I think they've tended to do well when they've gone into the market is what they've tended to nail is when they've been bringing people in who are going to come in and very much improve the first team from day one. I'd argue since Kerry Holland, everyone who's come in whose job it is to improve the first team has come in and improved the first team. And when that happens, what that does is that right now, for instance, Liverpool's first team is at a level where they're comfortable, comfortably able to be the fifth best team in the division. Now, if what that means is, or sit fifth in the league table, perhaps more accurately, be fifth or sixth best teams in the division. Mm. If what that means is that the next three or four players Liverpool bring in are better than that, then you've got a squad of players where the your first changes are players who are able to be starters in a side who were in fifth or sixth in the division. And that's what they've been doing. That is where that's going to get harder ultimately is in the notion of recruiting those players. Because if you're trying to bring someone in who's good enough to be able to play for, we'll continue to call it the top four. I take him as accurate earlier Manchester United point. But if you're bringing players in who are able to come and play for the top four, then what's going to be happening is that top four clubs are going to want those players. So yeah. that's immediately the stress that you've got if you're Liverpool. And I think it's important to keep that, you know, if Liverpool are going into the market for anyone, say, over 24, um, with what we've seen that we've got a sense of, because often this stuff's really opaque in the women's game, but you've also felt like they're tying or trying to tie their better players down into longer-term deals, then who are all sort of around the age of 24, 25, then you end up in this situation where well, you do need them to be better, because if that's the strategy and everyone understands the strategy, it's quite difficult to then sort of go, well, actually, no, it's not. So, you know, you look at those players who've come in, Kerry Holland now 26, we're, expect, we're not expecting her to be going anywhere anytime soon, Grace Fisk, uh, Taylor Hines, uh, Fuka Nagano, both 25, uh, Sophie Roman Hawks come in 24. So what the market Liverpool are sort of shopping in now, it looks like from where we sit, is that they're trying to buy players between the age of 23 and 26 who are good enough to play for Champions League teams in this country. Well, that's going to be hard. And I think accepting that and accepting that that's not going to be really, really straightforward is difficult. So, you know, Liverpool can still be looking at players like Mia Enderby, who they see a long-term prospect for. That's absolutely fine. And Liverpool can look to pick them up. But the the pool that Liverpool want to move into now, it is going to become, you know, they're going to be a smaller fish in that pool, which will have bigger fish in. But also the bar that they, they, they want to get, the quality they want to get is now of a certain level. So it is going to be really, really tricky. That's the thing that's going to be tricky. The other stuff they've managed to do up to this point, but that's the bit that's going to be tricky. Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting um, conversation. And to be honest, I feel like I could go into so much detail on this because there's not only the side from Liverpool's point of view, but also they're going into that um, that pond where there's a bigger fish, but there's also uh, bigger fish in terms of the ones that are fishing around Liverpool. So they're not just competing for those players and trying to attract those players, but they're competing against clubs that have arguably been in that market for longer, i.e. you've got um, some of the European clubs like Bayern Munich, like Wolfsburg, um, like Roma, for example, that are now starting to get into that market, Real Madrid. Um, and that's without taking out the whole Chelsea, Arsenal, Man City, etc., who will look to just add squad players who can be you know, a third-choice centre-back or a fourth-choice centre-back. So that in itself presents a huge challenge. But also, I think one of the things that Liverpool um, have looked ahead to do, and they obviously saw this as being a um, not an issue, but obviously a, a natural challenge in their progression um, towards the, the top end of, of the WSL, is that this was why the Melwood thing was so important. Yeah. Because if you're already in that bracket of that fifth and sixth, and you're trying to just get any little thing that will bring a player in, the difference between having the best training facility the difference between having the biggest club brand in the world, which let's be honest, other than Manchester United, I, I don't, I still don't really care what Chelsea have done in the women's game. Man United and Liverpool are the two biggest, biggest clubs in terms of a brand name. Um, and then you've then got to look at wages and Liverpool again might have a slight advantage over the likes of uh, Brighton, for example, uh, maybe Tottenham still just um, West Ham just, 
But I think it's those little things now where if you've got a training ground, if you can offer a little bit more money, if you can offer a brand, if you can offer um, better living conditions and a better city, um, that might just tip it over the edge. And I think that's what Liverpool in the background and from conversations that I've had with people there, I think that it's those sorts of things that they're hoping will help take these these new negotiations to the next level. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, if you look at the recruitment so far this year, you, you've seen that um, elevation. I mean, I don't know what you think ever, but probably the first half of the season, you know, Grace Fisk has been absolutely one of the bargains. She's been absolutely immense. Her and Gemma Bonner are probably our two most consistent performers. I think all the others have all had, I would say, big moments and big periods, but I would say those two feel to me the most consistent too. I mean, Grace Fisk, pretty much whatever you put in the back four, she's does it does the job and does it really well. Yeah, I'd add, I'd add Emma Corvisto into that list. I think she's been really, really strong this season. She's been really consistent at right back, but definitely Grace Fisk. And actually, I think at the start of the season, um, she kind of went under the radar because we were all talking about mm-hmm. Jenna Clark because she was obviously the the kind of the new up and coming signing, and obviously everyone was maybe a little bit uh, less aware of her abilities because she'd been playing in the Scottish League, whereas Grace Fisk had obviously been around the WSL for a while with West Ham, but. I do actually think Grace Fisk is, um, and I hold my hands up, I was the same. I was thinking, oh, Jenna Clark. But actually, when you look back at the stats and the performances, Grace Grace Fisk has arguably been better. So, um, yeah, definitely. I think she's been um, not just one of the signings for Liverpool, but one of the signings of the season, hands down. Um, and I'm slightly concerned that other clubs will be looking at her now, actually, because um, I think she might only have a year. Um, I think she was signed on a two-year contract. So maybe with the option for, for a third, I need to double-check that. So... Um, we'll yeah, have, I, we'll, have, we'll have to start talking her down then, so they won't, they won't look at her. Yeah, I'm slightly <laughs> concerned by that, but no, like she's, I think she's used to this level, and I think that's the difference. Mm. And when when Neil says about attracting certain players in that have got that Champions League quality, um, when when you're wanting to be a consistent fifth or sixth best team in the WSL, to have a player who has consistently played at a level that is worthy of fifth or sixth in the WSL is automatically going to help you. And I know that sounds silly. But it's such a basic um, level of recruitment that Liverpool have done. They haven't looked for anyone snazzy. They've not looked for European stars. They've gone, OK, who do we know is capable of playing at this level consistently week in, week out at the WSL and who will be a leader for us in that back line? And they've picked the right person out. So, um, yeah, well done to them, really. Cool. Neil, any, anyone else sort of really stood out for you, impressed you in the first six months? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Murray Hobinger is obviously the, the the clear name of someone who I just think has, has 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 impressed absolutely massively. I think that in general as well, the way in which that's clicked in that midfield three, you know, there's not an obvious sort of clear holder in amongst them as they've all worked together over the course of the campaign. You know, Holland really strong running, technically sound, knows where the goal is. Uh, Fukunagana keeps the ball moving. And Hobinger, I think, especially passes it ever so well in the final third, and is, is you know that's what she's excited, exciting about. And I think that the way those three have, have been able to to interact, I think, has been really, really important for Liverpool. I think also what they've shown is a lot of nous. And what I mean by that is that you think about some of these away games that Liverpool have, have done well in. It hasn't been this idea of you know they've known they're not going to be walking away with sixty percent possession, but the flip side is they've known really quite cleverly, I think, with one or two exceptions. I think it's one of the reasons why the manager was especially frustrated after the Manchester City game. Um, I think they've they've known when it's their opportunity and they've picked the moments well. And I think that that's something which he'll be most pleased by. So I think that, you know, Liverpool, because of the the setup um, with the with the wing backs, um, because they tend, not always, tend to only have two forwards on the pitch. They need that midfield three to be able to be all things uh, at different phases during the game. And they especially needed to be able to progress the ball up quite nicely in and out of phases of play. And I think that that's what they'll be pleased about. And I think the Hoban just really, really added to that in all the phases going right the way through. So, you know, I think there's still more to come from here and from a number of the signings. And again, this is back to the age that Liverpool have got them in at, that there is obviously scope for them to improve by virtue of coaching, the facilities, and also just playing together. But I feel as though, you know, it's... I, I, to get a good run of results, as strong a run of results as Liverpool have with a back three, with a back five uh, at times, um, I think is it takes it means that you've got to have very, very good players when the opportunities come. And that's what I think you've seen from them uh, in those specific areas. Cool. And Emma, from your perspective, sort of going into the first six months, it's sort of areas or areas of team of placing you thinking, hopefully, expecting a bit more 
than what we've seen so far. You know, some players are settling in. You know, we haven't really always had a settled front two. Um, so far, hard partly because of injury. Um, I mean, this is probably the most games we've had out of Shanice van der Sander, and you sort of see the value of that. And I think at the moment, the goalkeepers are still a little bit of rotation going around at the moment. Yeah, I, th- I think that's healthy though. I'd I'd be concerned if I, if I could tell you my you know my favourite starting eleven or the best starting eleven. I think mm-hmm. in an ideal world, when you're when you're trying to close in on that top four, you need to have a, a rotational team. And actually, one of the best things was when Kerry Holland was suspended for the Man, Man City game. Obviously, uh, you know the performance and the result didn't go to plan. But actually, the thought process bef- beforehand was that. You know, last season that would have been a disastrous, a disastrous suspension. And it's like, what do you do without Kerry Holland in the team? Now you just go, oh, actually, there's there's players who can slot in. And as Neil rightly said, you know, there's players who can play in different positions in that midfield, and they're quite fluid in terms of interchanging within the game. So that in itself is a is a good is a good thing. So I'm not too not too concerned about the lack of um, sort of consistency, I guess, uh, especially in the goalkeeper role. Um, yeah, for me, I'm really excited to see what Sophie um, Roman Hogg and Leanne Kernan can do in this second half of the season. Obviously, Kernan's been out for a while; she just started coming back to fitness. And I think you know we're used to seeing kind of that one that one forward up front, um, maybe players a bit more of a holding role in in a front three. Um, I'm really interested to see how we would do in a almost like a four four two scenario. Um, and I I don't think it's it's you know out the question that that could happen towards the second half of the season. And um, yeah, I think one of the things we've obviously just seen, you know, Tash Flint leave for Celtic. And I think one of the things with her is that she was always kind of a bit of a free role um, throughout her career. And maybe positionally she was, she wasn't as strong as some of the other options that we had in attack. So I'm not actually, I think on paper, it looked like a bit of a wild um, sort of decision to let her go. But realistically, I think when you look at the players that we've got coming back and, you know, if Shanice van der Sanning can stay consistently fit and Leanne Kernan can stay cons- consistently fit, then there's plenty of options in that front line. So, yeah, that's probably the main thing that I'm looking to see and whether that whether or not that will come off. I, yeah. th- I think just I think just in general, there's th- for Liverpool to get to where they want to get to, we all know that they want to get to. They do just do need to find a way to that, what the lineup will be when, they're, when they expect to be the better side. And mm-hmm. how so? I thought, for instance, it was you know the most frustrating game of the season is never at Anfield. In that, I just think that there's there's so many emotional factors to that that make it that make it difficult, and we've got to acknowledge them. The most frustrating games, the the Bristol City game, because yeah. because they're, they're not a good side, but that day Liverpool were just remarkably passive, and mm-hmm. for long periods, but that's in part because of the the nature of the setup um, in there and. You know, I think that I understand almost the idea of if you need to change, change it from the bench and you, you've got a certain way. But I just think if we're going to be sort of moving into the next the next phase of of where we want to be, then we've just got to make sure that every single time, we, you know, if Liverpool finish fifth this season, then ultimately there's five games minimum at home next season that Liverpool should be kicking off favourites in. Mm. And I think they've got to make sure they've got a really good way to make the running in those games. And that's, I think that that remains sort of a little bit of a challenge. And I'm, that's not to say that anyone's doing anything wrong with the minutes. I don't think that's the case. I think that Liverpool, the most important thing currently is to stay competitive, to stay alive in matches, to ensure that you don't have another 5-1. I don't think any of us want that. You know, there's stuff to work on around that. But the flip side of it is that will be the next phase for this side because more and more teams will go to Prenton Park and treat Liverpool with the utmost respect. And that's a good thing in loads of ways. But the flip side where it isn't is that you know, if sides have very much got the attitude of, I tell you what, it's a good, a good point here. Just get a point and get out is is something which I think in the in the long run can become difficult for a side to deal with. So that that remains my sort of my concern in terms of what Emma's describing, and I'm I'm absolutely certain that this manager and this set of players will solve that in the fullness of time. It's just that it might be that the second half of the season is a good opportunity to start that process by mm-hmm. by maybe changing it and occasionally playing one more forward, one fewer defender. Uh, something like that to sort of to sort of see if Liverpool can impose themselves from the outset. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean because you want to, sort of like almost like go to like a back four, and maybe be a bit more progressive from the start when you're playing a la Bristol, we're playing Bristol at home, but you know a team that ilk where you are expected to be a bit more dominant. You're obviously not going to try that when you're playing like Man City, Man City at home, but that's the sort of thing we're trying to do positively. I suppose from my outside looking in, the only concern I have. 
is I understand the Flint move, but it is putting a lot of hope on Leanne Kane and staying fit. And I do worry that's something we haven't now seen for a, uh, a good two years. Not her fault, you know, she gets a horrendous ankle injury. And I do sort of wonder if a lot of things stem from that ankle injury because it was, you know, a, a nasty one that she got. But that's my only concern is, is our sort of ace sleeve is, well, we're a one player getting a good run of fitness, which you all hope she does because when she's fit, we saw what she could do, you know, at the championship level. And she's got the thing that all teams hate, which is raw pace. Yeah, but I think when when you look at the forward options, you know, you got Mia Enderby, you got Leon Kernan, you've got Mel Lawley, you got Shanice Van der Sand, and you've got Sophie Roman Hag. Lucy Parry can play in that attacking role, Missy Bo Kearns can play in that attacking role. So I do think across across the whole squad, bearing in mind we're a team that plays with one striker at the moment. Mm. Um, I do think that there's enough options. And actually, you know, if you're looking at if you're looking at future planning, um I, I'm fully convinced this is my own opinion no sort of future intel on on summer signings but i'm fully convinced that liverpool would be going out and spending some money in the summer transfer window and i would expect them to um bring in you know some some attacking quality um to take to the next level that sort of bridging gap that neil's discussed earlier um i would expect some more recruitments maybe in fullback positions um and maybe in, it, even in the goalkeeper um maybe uh, you know a stronger third goalkeeper it wouldn't surprise me if those those options are addressed in the summer. So um, I'm I'm not too concerned. I think with the players coming back and the numbers that we've got, I can't remember how many names I listed there. What was that? Five six. Yeah. Um, I I think there's enough players there without without Tash Flint in that in that front line personally. And it's, and it's a 27 year old who's played circa 250 minutes uh, mm -hmm. across all the league games. There's 10 league games left. There were Conti Cup games, but I think that from this point forward. We'd be hoping to see a strong Liverpool FA Cup team. There's no more Conti yeah. Cup games. So I think you're not, you know, listen, it's a good move for the player and that the player needs to play. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, she's, she's at the age of 27, a professional footballer. She needs to be getting time on the pitch somewhere. And then I think that also, it, it does open up the idea that there could be one or two opportunities for, for for other players, but there is there is the sort of strength that Emma's referred to. But also, as I say, it's it now is just simply, you know, this is part of the, the women's game is that it is now across between now and May, it is just simply 10 remaining league games. That's it. Um, there's not, you know, there's, there's there's odd periods of flurries of massive excitement because that's what happens. And then there's extended periods where if players need a little bit of work and a bit of time to get themselves back fit, the worst could always happen, Chris. But I, I just think the idea of, you know, if, if, if Flint was four or five years younger, you could make an argument that she's a player Liverpool could hold on to and look to develop along with the rest of the squad. But at the age of 27, I do just sort of feel like she needs to be playing somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I think I was more of the opinion, not that keep Flint. It was more about I wondered if they was going to be looking at bringing someone in. Now, listen, they may have someone lined up in the summer, and that person can't be brought forward. But that was more of a you kind of sort of is it a bit of a one in one out situation? But it doesn't appear to be the case. It appears to be they've given the player what she wants, which is game time at Celtic, uh, and we're happy with what we've got. That was the only thing outside looking. You wondered would that maybe be a, a scenario rather than keeping the player, just more of a bring a different option in but like I said we also don't know who Matt Beard is looking at and who he's looking at might be a summer option that we have to wait for which is you know perfectly fine because no point bringing a player in he doesn't he doesn't want or he's going to use um, but talking about sort of we'll come back to Liverpool and talk about where we think the rest of the season going to go but let's just sort of talk about WSL as a whole so you know with the top three is Chelsea, Arsenal, Man City Man City are you know very much improved on by their standards, a disappointing season. Man United, probably not where they expected to be. Um, I mean, sort of the Bristol probably were expected to be in around the bottom, and Villa have slowly started to improve. But they had quite a difficult start in the Everton to start to start the season. Probably not one that many of us too fair expected. Yeah, Villa were obviously the big surprise. Um, they were hurt by the early injuries to Kenza Dali and obviously the suspension to Kirsty Hansen, but they've. They've just had a pretty awful season, to be honest. And even with the the improvements in recent weeks, I think it's what is it six wins out there last nine do we sell games, something like that, or nine games in all competitions. Um, so they're kind of on the rise now. But you know, these are games that they were expected to win, and actually, I, I think they're eighth in the table at the moment. So um, they should be higher, really. They should be up there challenging with with Liverpool and, and Tottenham. And you know, they they might only be a few points off, but in terms of the quality of the performance and the way that the trajectory feels it just feels a, you know a lot more positive at, at Tottenham and Liverpool so there's definitely work there to do for Villa they've been hit by injuries um 
I think they've, they've struggled in the January transfer window. I think a lot of that's come from the men's side in terms of the financial fair play, which I could go into all day, which I won't bother. Um, but I, I just think that there's a lot of things that have kind of gone against them, some by their own making and, and some out, uh, you know, outside. But yeah, Villa, really disappointing. I think Everton, I think I tweeted this the other day, I think Brian Sorensen has, has been absolutely magnificent because how Everton aren't, you know, in a in a relegation battle really is beyond me because they've basically had no no squad depth at all. They've had a, a huge injury crisis. They've lost key players. They've lost like their two best centre backs in both transfer windows. Their best full back. They've lost their best forward who's retired uh, over Christmas. Um, and yet, you know, they're still putting in good performances. And yeah, they lost to Leicester in their last game, which I'll be really disappointed about. But um, Look, I think they're stable enough in the table and I think it will be a grind for them. But um, yeah, I think they've, they've done really well. And as you said, Man United, um, I think it's quite obvious that, that they're in a bit of a sticky situation. Um, they should be qualifying for the Champions League. Anything outside of that is is not good enough. And I think um, they need to turn it around very, very quickly. And I think, to be honest, they need to re- win all of their games, really, for the for the end of the season to uh, to kind of put up a bit of a fight. So yeah, they're they're in they're in a bit of trouble. I think I think uh, Neil, um, we talked about uh, Leicester and Tottenham have probably been you know really impressive. You know, Willie Kirk's done great work. Leicester are an absolute nightmare to play against. As we discovered once he took over, they're horrible to play against. They just just don't give you spark time and space. And Tottenham are always going to be a threat when you have Martha Thomas and Beth England. I mean, that's just a scary front two option to have. You know, plus the depth and they don't concede many. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I'm struck by there's this odd little thing that I think happens at the the, the, the outside the top four sides. I feel a little bit like of the woman's got to commit to one thing or the other. And what I mean by that is they're either going to work out whether or not they're going to be a really good attacking unit or a really good defensive one and go from there. And I think you get to see you almost get to see those decisions be made and you you know the truth of them's in. The league table and if you're fortunate enough to have access to see some of the underlying numbers then you can see that as well and it's picking those moments really when you're working out what it is that you're going to be uh, and I think that that's what you've sort of seen Leicester do a really good job of in terms of being horrible to play against and then there's the feeling that Tottenham will try and find a way to be a little bit more progressive uh, and you get to so- you get to sort of see that and live reality the really interesting Man United thing is and why things don't look good in general at Manchester United is that the best way to sort of depict them over the course of the season is as soon as it's hard, they go to pieces. Mm. And that is something that is concerning because, because the talent of the players they've got, it's worth sort of pointing out that, you know, the still, the goal difference is still pretty healthy. It's not quite as healthy as Arsenal's, but not that much worse. They've scored as many goals as Arsenal, but what sort of done United in over the course of the campaign, whenever I've caught them is as soon as they're in a game, they're not in a game. And I think that's a little bit what happens against Liverpool. Liverpool have the good sense and managed to drag them into one. And, you know, without sort of getting back on my absolute hobby horse, you know, I think that in the in the Rachel <laughs> Williams header, it's not even a header, oh, it's an assault. I think yeah. you get to see what I thought that United, she was one example of it. I thought United were remarkably ill-disciplined in every phase of the game last half an hour. Yeah. Kept giving it away cheaply, cheap free kicks getting given away, players getting ratty with each other, getting ratty with themselves, bad decision making. And Liverpool, you know, you look at United's record over the course of the campaign, you know, it's worth sort of saying that Liverpool are, in inverted commas, not in inverted commas, actually the poorest team to have beat them. But that to me almost spoke volumes as to where they found themselves and what they found themselves be doing. They also drew 1 1 at home to Leicester, which, as you just said, Chris, they're horrible to play against. So there's this feeling, I think, for United that when it's easy, they're going and showing it and they're showing what they're about. But I, I think as a team, I think they've lost the way a little bit. And, you know, without I don't know anything really significant about it, anything that may or may not be going on behind the scenes or anything like that. But it just comes over like it's all a little bit dysfunctional. And as I say, that, that you know, that particular moment with, with Gemma Bonner was, was I think, an aspect of that. And this idea that a, a footballer's got to come on the pitch and run into people to save the day at the end of matches, which they've sort of tr- created into a mini cult for themselves, I actually think is counterproductive in loads of ways. I mean, quite literally, people being carried off with concussions one way. But, you know, in loads of ways, that's where they've sort of ended up. And and I, you know, I think it's it's potentially a bit of a long campaign for them. And I'm, I'm very struck by this idea that they've actually, you know, they've played six home games and only won two. It, Again, that's another marker for me where I'm going, something's not right somewhere here because the the fact feeling the pressure and matters in their own ground. So I think it could be a tough sort of remainder of the campaign for them. And then obviously what you've got at the very top is 
you know, a Chelsea side who are able to continually um, firstly reassert themselves, rebuild themselves, and are in a in a position to 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 be hoovering up the very best talent at all at all stages. And you know, I think it'll be a big effort for Manchester City to to overhaul what is only a three point gap at this stage, but. It's three points in a universe where it's very possible that either of these two sides only drops points in one more game. Yeah, that's that's the, that's the issue with Chelsea. Is they very rarely drop points. I mean, I suppose the contrast you can see is Arsenal probably had, didn't have the start they were hoping for. You know, they obviously lost the first game against Liverpool and when they went one, went one nil down, they never really looked like doing too much. Whereas, literally, I was at the game the other night. Um, I thought they... I thought Liverpool played well first half. You know, kept it, kept it dogged, kept them, kept themselves in it, made it a fight. But Arsenal just had that little bit of stardust where they go, if needs be, they got Nida Maru could just bang it. And if you haven't seen it, I know it's against Liverpool. Like it's one, it's an absolute stunner of a goal. But then it was what I would call it was the most grown up performance I'd seen at Prince of Park, which basically Liverpool didn't play badly. They could not get the ball off them, and they just said, "We'll just tie you out and tie you out and tie it," and eventually. It'll fall for us, and I didn't feel that's where in the Manchester weekend they gave they gave that it, it, as you say it came frenetic. It had to be end to end. It had to be all guns blazing, and that kind of played into people's hands. Where the worst thing you can do, I think, when you play on sides like Liverpool, Leicester, Tottenham, is you make them chase you and not have the ball because eventually fitness and quality will will withhold out. And I kind of wonder why United have moved away from that because that's what they were good at last year when they finished second. Is once they went ahead, you couldn't get the ball. From. Yeah, I think I, I think some of it's probably a confidence thing as well. You know, uh, it's, it's a mentality thing. And I think Neil's hit the nail on the head, actually, when things aren't going well, they seem to struggle because, yeah, there's far too much quality in that side for them to be rushing passes and for them to be getting impatient. And um, they just look restless. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to explain. It's really hard to explain. Yeah. So before we go on to talk about potential improvements or we think what's going to happen next in the WSL, um, you can see in the, the uh, caption below, uh, links in the description below, uh, our charity fundraiser partners this year are the Lighthouse in Dublin and fan supporting food banks in Liverpool. So the target we've set ourselves is we want to raise €10,000. And when we get to that magic number, uh, we're going to split it 50-50. So um, for those bigs around here, we know what fan supporting food banks about. You see them outside the Edson games, the Liverpool games. This is to help people you know, who are struggling to feed themselves. And... The Lighthouse, which Gav has educated me on, is a cafe that is in Dublin city centre. And what they basically do is it's, you know, they feed people who basically either are homeless or times are tough, you know, and they, and they want someone to feed, or you just want a bit of a warmth and a chat because, you know, times are hard and lonely and, you know, provide clothing for people as well. So these are, you know, big charities. And if you take anything away from this is the link to the description below to just give a page. If you can give, please give. If you can't, just share it around WhatsApp groups. You never know who who will touch these sort of things, and it will, you know, just help people out who need it. So, Emma, back to WSL. What where do you think is next in terms of you know, it's a growing product. Whether you like the word, people hate that phrase, but it, it's a growing league. It's got a product, you know, all the eyes on it. Sky Sports, it's, you know, you know, it's a growing product with Sky Sports and BBC are picking this up and showing live games. So we know it's going that way. The crowd's getting big. I think. The Liverpool game last night, there was 6,000, which is, you know, a big crowd at Prenton Park. But where do you sort of feel next stages are for, whether it's infrastructure, whether that's teams, where's your sort of thoughts on it? That's a million-dollar question, isn't it, Chris? Um, <laughs> for those who didn't see, you know, some of the national media were invited down to Wembley this week to speak to Nicky Doucette, who is the CEO of the NUCO, which is the takeover company set to... Um, take over the WSL in the summer. So that will be a club-owned group led by uh, Nicky Doucet. And the FA will have a, a, a small stake in the company, but otherwise it will be largely predominantly led by, by the WSL clubs. So there's obviously a lot of questions here, a lot of things that need dealing with um, new broadcast deals. It's absolute priority. And I think that um, could have a dramatic impact on what happens next. Um, there is, you know, a case where they just extend the existing deal for another 12 months. That's um, as per my understanding, but um, it's still very much in that kind of discussion phase. But I do think a lot of it depends on this broadcast deal. If they obviously agree 
a new one, which is a significant increase in terms of investment on the previous, well, the current deal, um, then I think that could obviously open the door for lots of changes. For me, the first one has to be um, the officiating. Referees have to be full-time. If you have a full-time professional league, you need full-time professional uh, officials. That's my number one. Um, the second thing would be, uh, you know, uh, there's a couple of things in the WSL license that I would like to see mandatory. Um, I did, I'm very passionate about this. I've written about it a few times, but I did a big um, piece on mental health in the WSL recently. And um, at the moment, it's not mandatory to have a specialist um, psychologist at clubs in the WSL, which for me is mind blowing. Um, and then I just think there's also things that need adding in in terms of certain pieces of infrastructure. So I think you need to have, um, I don't know, let's say at least 15 members of staff that are full time within a within a WSL setup, things like that. And I think that at the moment is is the priority for me is building that. When I say infrastructure, I mean everything around the pitch. You know, I think there's enough money now in terms of we're seeing transfer fees, we're seeing wages increase, we're seeing teams play at stadiums, we're seeing um, tickets being sold. I think that's a great start and we can obviously build on that. I do think that will start to just build naturally in itself anyway. Um, but I would like to see that the team built around that improves. So, you know, um, yeah, more staff members, um, improvement in facilities, uh, getting the right professional officials and getting the right um, support in terms of well-being as well. They're the big ones for me. Some of those are mentioned in the Karen Carney review as recommendations, uh, which the government mm -hmm. said they're going to carry forward and as part of the new code, they're meant to be in there. But the, they're all the way through to the championship, the women's championship. And I think one of the things that's important from any, and there should be, by the way, an increased broadcast deal. I'll circle back around onto that. But one of the things that's important is to ensure that there is a flow of money. Um, so the top clubs do not... Um, you know, the worst thing that could happen here is that this ends up sort of copying the the, the Premier League pattern uh, and setting in for decades of future fighting over where the resource does or doesn't go. This is about growing the game. Um, it's about raising the the, the, the Carney report called Raising the Bar. It's about raising the bar, but it's also simultaneously about growing the game and understanding that the only way that that bar is, is genuinely raised over a long period is if standards are raised everywhere because then you create to you know emma's infrastructure points you create infrastructure then on a national level along with infrastructure existing in a, in a club by club basis but obviously the idea of you know every psychologist there needs to be a psychologist at every championship club well that comes at a cost and that cost is i mean the the, the review uh sort of guesstimates at forty thousand pounds a year which is perfectly valid and i'm not saying it's a bad good but good guess or a bad guess but what i'm saying is that that's that forty thousand pounds a year has got to come from somewhere uh, it talks about having support of liaison officers, but well, the money for that's got to come from somewhere. To Emma's point around how many full-time staff you have, there's still not full-time footballers at women's championship level. The money for that's got to come from somewhere. And where it should come from is from the next broadcasting deal. I think there's a general issue around women's football um, and its relationship with what we can almost call, well, we can call business on the whole. Like There was a lot of trumpet and noise made about the previous broadcast deal as though it was it was an astonishing amount of money and the sponsor deal. And the truth of it is, by the standards of broadcast deals for elite sports in a worldwide context, both men's and women's, it wasn't. Mm. And it was acted as though it was a massive statement by a couple of companies and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't. Not really, not in the grand scheme of things. And where the bar is, I think, for investments in a partnership sense around women's sport in general, but especially around women's football, I think it's it's still remarkably cheap. I have been told in my sort of general conversations of that there's one one of the women's shirt sponsors uh, in this league and a, on a yearly basis is is paying us some money less than fifty thousand pounds, maybe even less than forty thousand pounds, and that doesn't pay for the aforementioned psychologist. <laughs> Yeah. you know in in the context of this so i think it's important that first and foremost there's protections built in um that go to all the thir the the 32 clubs uh who currently well who are the aim to be part of this the 32 clubs in the first place um or 24 clubs if you're going to stay stay the level that, that it's currently being at that that remains in there that there's protections and, and there is money flow so that you know even even because we can't have a situation where simultaneously the top sort of six, the top six this season 
in the uh, in the in the WSL as it stands are the traditional defined big six in the in the Premier League, and that that cannot be healthy, not least because of the nature of the, the flow, the cash flow between those clubs. The idea that in a PSR sense, uh, money that goes into the women's team can be written off as well. Uh, out of out of PSR submissions in the men, around the men's side, that has to happen. So we can't we can't just sort of perpetuate that by then also skewing it so that you know effectively league money only goes that way. And then within that, you've got three Champions League teams where that's also going to only go one way. It's got to protect all the way through, but also create the facilities all the way through because it's only in creating the facilities and the infrastructure all the way through that you end up with a significant pool of players and a diverse pool of players wherein you've then got the best talent that you can get in order to have the best footballers that you can get and go from there. So it's really got to be all the building blocks have got to come through sort of simultaneously. And the next broadcast deal is really, really important around that. Simultaneously with the broadcast deal and sponsorship deal, the other thing that should not happen is that the idea of the game being on free-to-air television in any way, shape or form disappears. And because there needs to be that idea that it can be seen it can be watched and there is a gateway. That's not to say that all the games need to be on free-to-air television. I don't think that that's the case. But I think that the idea that there is at least one game, and ideally, I would argue the highest profile game most weeks, is available on free-to-air television, I think is a really, really important thing. And I mean that even more so if the argument around uh, women's games being able to be screened at 3pm on a Saturday is to be seen through to its end. I think there needs to be an understanding that if that's the case, then what's most important if you are going to begin that process with the long established, what's called the blackout, that you're doing it for the best possible reasons. And those reasons will be to grow the game as much as possible. And within that, therefore, it becomes that that's got to be the best game. So that's the one that's on BBC One or ITV. Um, and that's that. I think that's where you have to sort of end up. And all of that obviously involves a lot of moving parts, everything we've said there. But that's the job, I think, from. When the main, when the journalists went down uh, to interview Nikki Doucette, there was just bad sound bites, just daft sound bites came out of it that just didn't sort of bode well in a couple of ways, you know. And and that's listen, the sound bites exist and 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 they're sort of taken for a reason. But you know, I perhaps wrongly immediately worry when uh, the main reason why what not the the big part of someone's CV that's trumpeted to you that they were a banker. Um, I immediately sort of go, hang on a little bit. I don't quite know how women's football is going to be equivalent to Glastonbury. I've been to Glastonbury, um, and I don't quite. And I've been to women's football. And I don't quite know how we're going to manage both of these things um, simultaneously. You're not alone. You're not alone there. And and I think I think that that's what I don't want. And it's important this because there's absolutely no shadow of a doubt that that Nikki Doucette's a very very intelligent person because she wouldn't have achieved what she's achieved and so on and so forth. But what I mean here is this is why it's important that intelligent people comport themselves as intelligent people and don't just try to say something that sounds like, Hey kids, that's, that's not, that's not sort of going to be long-term good. There's, there needs to be a sort of a bit of sobriety around this. And while simultaneously the stars are the players and that's got to be the story that comes out of it all. And I'm, you know, the, it's no reason to be cynical. People saying one or two, I say daft things all the time. People saying one or two daft things is no reason to be cynical. But I think it's just in my live shows, mate. I say I say plenty of daft things. There we are. So I think that you know we we can all we can all get on board with that. But I think that there's there is a pretty sober set of recommendations that have come out of a a pretty decent review. I, I think if we're all honest, we'd have perhaps like a little bit more detail within the review that was that that came out of the Carney review. Its its principles and its essence was the right general direction. But it felt very much like a review that was done on vibes um, in the in the grand scheme of things. But they were good vibes. They weren't bad vibes. But now what worries me about that is when there's vibes, there's more room for manoeuvre, for people to find ways to, to cut corners uh, around bits and pieces. And for me, I couldn't agree more with them around the infrastructure point, but I think that the, the, you know, in every single sense, but it's really, really important that you don't end up in a situation where there's a rush that leaves championship clubs in particular. And I can think of two or three who, who, you know, would find it exceptionally difficult that we ensure that those clubs are protected. Um, not least because they've been, you know, we've seen it all. We've seen it previously with Doncaster Rovers in the women's game, that what you can't do is the clubs who've been, been there and done, done the decent thing suddenly find it exceptionally difficult to, to cope in another new era. Yeah, I think what, what what was really important, like really interesting. One of the things that you mentioned there, Neil, was 
was this idea of uh, sort of men's clubs finances having an impact on the women's team. Now, this is a question among several questions that we have asked in these meetings with Nuko, all of which have come back with, we don't know that yet. Um, you should see the transcript. Um, and it is basically whether or not there's going to be an implementation of a financial fair play in the women's game, which I am on board with, because I think there's a scenario at the moment where you have, uh, I mentioned it earlier, Aston Villa, FFP in the men's side, Everton, FFP on the men's side, ownership issues on the men's side affecting the running of the women's team. This is already happening in the WSL. We know it has a dramatic impact in the women's championship. Reading, who got yeah. relegated from the WSL last season, they're in big trouble in the championship. Um, it's just, it, there's a knock-on effect. There needs to be something in play, I think, where um, basically women's teams are financially sustainable on their own. And this is something that has been discussed at length. I don't really know what that means. I don't really know, know what it looks like. All I know is that I agree with it. I'm not a banker. I'm not a financial expert. But there must be something put in place to ensure that the women's team's survival doesn't rely on a men's team getting promoted, getting relegated or staying within the league. Um, women's team success should surely have their own entity and financial gain within that. And also just as part of that process, um what matters is there is also the teams that that have no uh, men's obvious men's team support, mm. yeah. and and those teams are the ones that will need could do with the protection, and that protection can come in a variety of different ways, you know. And I think that we've got to step step away from. There's lots of little bits of this that when I, sometimes being really really honest, not least as a man who supports a, a big club, one of the things I often find difficult talking about. So. I'm, I'm, there's the contradictory messages that if you're not careful, you sort of send out, but it is problematic that effectively, you know, Newcastle with the greatest will in the world are able to swan in to yeah. the Northern Premier Division and have won 10 out of 12 and are battering everyone and Nottingham Forest are in second. Then you, you've then got Burnley in third. Liverpool feds are doing absolutely brilliantly, brilliantly to be in fourth. You go then look at the championship sides and what you can't have is, you know, Lewis find themselves in a situation where they're second bottom in the championship. And if the direction of travel stays as it stays, it's really hard to imagine how they could possibly retain a championship status. Might not be today, might not be tomorrow, but it's coming soon. And that is, it's really, really important to ensure that that's protected on the one hand. And as this often goes with the women's game, but on the other, what you can't have is the negative aspect of that where Reading are, as Emma says, getting absolutely battered you know, by this notion of of this, that effectively resources is being cut relentlessly from the women's side, being cut full stop or being cut from the women's side. But that's had literally nothing to do with what's gone on mm -hmm. uh, over there. Absolutely nothing. And at times when resources are cut at football clubs anyway, full stop, you know, even the football, the, the, the men's footballers, it may not be down to them either. I want to be really clear when I say that. But at times there is a relationship between that success, a very direct relationship between that success and otherwise. So there's got to be a, a bit of thinking around that. A lot of this stuff always sounds as though it is therefore quite contradictory, and I'm, I'm sort of conscious of that. To go back to the, the, the Rachel Williams thing from, from earlier on in the same way with the officiating, one of the things that I find exceptionally difficult with the officiating, as Emma talks about, is no one quite knows how to talk about it or where to draw the line. So yeah. there's, this, there's this notion that no one wants to say that these women need to be better protected because that makes it feel as though you're saying they're feminine and they're soft and all this sort of nonsense. Simultaneously, no one wants to say that a number of these women act in a way that I think is not too short away from thuggery on the pitch at times because you don't want to say that either. So you end up in a situation yeah. where no one really wants to call things out for what they are. And because not least because none of us want to talk the women's game down uh, in any way, shape or form because we love going and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite difficult to, to, and again, it's even harder from the position of my gender to do this, to sort of deal through the, the squalls of this and find a way to talk through the process. What yeah, is so clear... Um what is clear with the officiating is that it's not fit for purpose. There are tackles that tackles and challenges that if they happened in the men's game would be immediate red cards that often aren't even given as free kicks or certainly, and certainly not even as yellow cards. And that is happening. I think because the players, I don't think are shown, are shown anywhere near enough care, but also they've seen the standards of previous tackles that are ongoing in there. Yeah. And then that's happening in every WSL and championship game every single weekend. But people are really reluctant to genuinely call it out for the reasons I've said before. The, it's not to say that, you know, gen, quite genuinely, there was blood dripping from Gemma Bonner in two different places and she was concussed to the point that she couldn't remember the incident. So this is not in no way, shape or form is that a soft human. 
that is, you know, yeah. a remarkably hard person who got absolutely walloped. And on the live commentary, and why it really frustrated me was no one said that's out of order. Later the same day, Liverpool played Manchester United, and there would have been a riot on the pitch if a Manchester United player had done that to Virgil Van Dijk. But no one yeah. called it at all in this for in, not not on any of the coverage, not on any of the post match, not on anything that I saw written down. Did anyone say that sort of stuff's got to be eradicated? Going all the way up and down this, and as I say, I do think the two things are linked. There's got to be a way to make the argument to protect the sides that need protecting on the one hand, then protect the sides that need protecting from mismanagement on what we can broadly call the men's side on the other. Allow the idea of challenging for excellence, but also ensure that what we don't do is in encouraging challenging for excellence end up in the situation where you've got an unbelievable st stockpile of talent at Chelsea. And then simultaneously, the next thing I then end up saying is one of the ways you do that is that you, you have players ideally play fewer games. But there's another challenge, which is that whilst the sides that play Champions League football and have loads of international players, their players are possibly overplayed. Mm -hmm. Flip side of that is you can make a bit of an argument that, for instance, sides like Liverpool don't play anywhere near enough games in the context of wanting to grow the game and be able to tell the story as to what's happening. So how do we square that circle as well? And so many of the reasons why I think that the 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 the, the the Carney review, whatever's happening with Newco, these are serious challenges. And as I say, a lot of them, the language around them or the way in which you think about them, there's genuine internal contradictions that'll take a lot of unknotting. And I think yeah. firstly, allowing people a bit of time to unknot some of them is important. But also secondly, the idea of, of taking seriously right the way through, all the way down to the bottom of the National League in, in its northern and southern sense, where all of these are, and then looking at the challenge of not just girls' grassroots, though definitely girls' grassroots, but also women's grassroots, because there's another thing we do here as well, which is that we act as though grassroots football is only played by children. It is not. So how do we ensure there's sufficient pitch provision and so on and so forth in that context? These are all real tricks, and it needs, you know, the my biggest worry is that is that effectively we're looking at another review in eight years because uns unknotting a lot of this has just proven... It's just proven a little bit tricky and the same teams will be at the top that are at the top now and are at the top of the men's game. And we'll have lost some of the heritage of the others and missed an opportunity in amongst all of this in the meantime, because ultimately the, the sides with the, with the deepest pockets also tend to have the loudest voices. And there's just a bit too much, as I say, I'll say it again on vibes and also from the, the now existing vibes around the, the other bits and pieces, you do feel as though, the direction of travel feels like it's more likely to be that way, but I, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, because what you don't want to do is is big women's teams as Durham, Sunderland, Lewis disappear. Because when I started following women's football eight years ago, the big games were Christ Durham and Sunderland. They're, they're the game, they're they're the games you don't want to play. They're, whereas you don't see them now because they're, they're both in the championship. I mean, what happened to them was a it, it could be a whole podcast. To be fair, what happens on them, but it's um, that sort of thing I do because everyone doesn't associate Durham as one of the the big women's football teams, but it, it is. It's historically built within the women's teams, it's just because they're not connected to a men's team, it doesn't get that link. I mean, the two pairs of which is probably not as big and as grandiose as you guys are, which which are more about. I'm sure of mine is my big gripe still with women's football is communication. I find that the I think there's still a lot of women's a lot in the outside of women's football. There's a lot of assumption, as in you assume you know when the games are, what's going to happen. You assume you know how you're going to get your tickets. Which for this club you do it through Liverpool. For this club you ring Man United. For this for this game you do this. You assume that the, everyone knows that two minutes later, uh, oh yeah, all the Conte Cup games get reorganised. Like Liverpool literally Conte Cup fixtures got flipped in a week, and one of the games never happened. No one was moved to January. You're going. It just wouldn't happen in the men. It wouldn't happen in the men's game because there's a structure and order of how things are done. And I find we both don't shout about the good things. So Neil, you're talking about free to wear. The FA play is a great thing. If you don't, if you don't follow women's football, you wouldn't know it existed. That basically you can watch pretty much most WSL games that aren't on BBC or Sky for that. Yeah. That's a way of growing the game. And it costs you nothing. And I find things like that, but what I have liked recently is um, I've only seen two episodes of it. Arsenal recently done a documentary which is about Beth Mead's knee injury and um, Lee Williams. Niedermeyer. Uh, oh, Niedermeyer and Mead, yeah, Niedermeyer. yeah. And that is starting to, it's interesting, it's, it was trying to dispel the myths of why do we see so, so many ACL injuries in women's football? And it was 
I'm only two episodes in, but it's just dispelling some myths that we assume are facts, or some of the physiological ones. They go, ah, that's probably not always the case, actually. And there are other things that we talk about, you know, to do with the female body. Saying, it doesn't really work. If that's the case, you'd never have an ACL injury in men's football. So that doesn't make sense. But it's things I wish thinking I'm finding interesting, but don't communicate, don't shout it. It just happens to be shown on the sky as a bit of a bit of a side project. And I just find communication is never has never been a strong point in the women's game. And I think it needs to be. If you've got to grow it, you've got to communicate how things work. And you know, into basic things of if you want to get a picture with, with a player, there's kind of a rule a, a way of doing it. Whereas at the moment it's a bit bit of a free for all and you know it's doesn't always make it a pleasant experience sometimes but that's kind of my group I, obviously i'm talking small side as just as a, a punter who goes you know yeah I'm but it, it, it all comes side. into that match day experience isn't it and i think there's a lot around it that needs doing um yeah it's just the general running of a match day experience there's hmm. marketing teams communication teams um and again i think this all comes down to infrastructure personally because it all has a knock-on yeah. effect of of, of of everything really Cool. So before we go then, let's have a bit of a chat about the running as, as Neil, you said there's ten games left, hopefully more, because we've got an FA Cup tie away to London City Lionesses, which are division below. So um, I remember playing London City Lionesses in the championship, but it was never a fun it was never a fun game. It's always nope. a difficult away. But you're kinda of hoping if Liverpool get through, we might be getting what we've been hoping for, which is a bit of a cup run, which would be quite nice. We haven't had one for a while. Yeah, I think, I think, listen, I think next weekend's quite significant, the home game against Tottenham in that, you know, I think if Liverpool don't win that, I think it's, I mean, I think in general anyway, Liverpool should be very much going with the best 11 to London City and not messing about because it is an opportunity uh, where resource can be pushed more in that way. But I think certainly if they don't, if they don't, if they get beat by Tottenham, say, then I think that, you know, we know what the rest of the season is from that point. And that's absolutely fine. I I, I feel as though this Liverpool side's shown enough it's it's shown vulnerabilities away from home at Manchester City and Chelsea, but it's also shown enough to suggest that if it was to get a kind cup run, there's the, the, or not even that kind of cup run from the sort of from the sixth round stage, that it's got real opportunities. It, it is able to make an argument of beat anyone on our day. That's no bad thing. So I I feel as though that's that's the most important thing of the next three. There's another big break because of course there is, uh, and then there's a big break the other side of that. But um, the, it's. I think those three, Tottenham at home, getting something from London City, well, not getting something, going through against London City, and then going to a Brighton side, which which may be quite tough, but you know, I think that there's no reason why Liverpool can't come out of those three games unbeaten. And the main one to win, the priority one to win, is is just is the one against London City. Um, you know, because I think that the, in the whole sort of idea, there's the general galvanisation of women's football that we've just talked about, but I think that nothing would be better for this Liverpool side than a galvanisation in, in, in the city, and the best way to do that is to get a cup run from this point. Cool. Emma, anything you want to from your perspective? Yeah, I was just looking at the fixtures for February and March, and I'm sure we'll come on to this in a future podcast, but I just think this is a significant period in that Liverpool could have the, their WSL season almost wrapped up by the end of February, mid-March, in terms of where they want to be if they if they win the games they should be winning, they would be in an extremely strong position mid March, and that gives you scope to to really really push for those cup competitions. We saw Villa reach the semi finals last season, West Ham have reached uh, semi finals. I think maybe two seasons before, um, yeah. off the back of good WSL runs. So all it needs is a little bit of momentum, and I think when you get to those stages of the competition, and it is a bit of a a hit and grab one off game, um, there's no reason Liverpool can beat any team in the league apart from maybe Man City um, or Chelsea on their day. So, yeah, why not? But I, I, I look at those, like I say, I look at that February March and I think there's only really Man City that for me uh, are the, is the obvious team that Liverpool shouldn't be beating. But Brighton obviously will be tricky, but you've got West Ham in there as well that Liverpool should be beating. So a, a significant period, I think, um, in the next six weeks. Yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? Uh, so, Emma, before we go, any sort of new articles, anything? You want to plug? For, I know you did an interview. Was it? I think it was last month. Was it with uh, Frank Kirby? Yes. Um, yeah, a very powerful interview on um, stigma around body image. She spoke mm. extremely well. I thought um, raised a lot of issues around sort of social media and comments and attitudes towards female bodies. So definitely want to check out. There's so much going on this week. WSL transfer deadline day. We've got a live Q and A going out on Tuesday morning between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. That's the first time I've given that time. So if you're hearing it here first, that's an exclusive for, uh, <laughs> for Chris's podcast. But, um, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah that, that'll be basically answering all of your questions. So a very busy week, this one. There'll be lots out there. Awesome. And Neil, I mean, now to wrap, there's, just, there's always something going on. Isn't yeah, there? we're fine. Don't worry about us. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. But well, listen, Neil, Emma, thanks very much for joining us. I, I do enjoy doing these podcasts, especially when they're doing really well, which is always great fun. So Thank listen, you. like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and we'll speak to you all very, very soon.